Always good to turn the mic. There you go. Now we're live. Uh, and so let me start again. My name is Alan Lumsden. I'm the medical director for the Heart and Vascular Center. And you're going to hear tonight from two of our stars. And this is one of the first in the series of uh, public education seminars that we're trying to do to raise the public awareness about cardiovascular disease. Now, a couple of announcements, first of all. We are filming this. We are filming, and we're actually live streaming it. It doesn't, you won't, they will not see you at all. They're going to focus basically on the presenters up here. And when we get to taking questions, we'll turn that off so there's complete anonymity uh, from the general public standpoint. So the whole idea of this is to focus on some of the more common problems that exist around cardiovascular disease. I did clinic this afternoon. I swear probably at least 50% of my patients on the previous medical history have got AFib written down there. So it's a remarkably common problem. And the one that I think we have unique expertise here in the Heart and Vascular Center to talk about. My job is also to referee between the cardiologists and the surgeons and make sure we all kind of stay on the same page and, we, and we're, we're talking about the disease process. And so I think what's been built here is a unique capability around AFib, and I'm going to be your moderator this afternoon. The format of this is going to be the first person we're going to hear from basically is Dr. Valderabno, who I'm about to introduce. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Randy Wolf, and then we're going to have time for questions. Uh, so stick around basically for questions and we'll see if we can answer them. So with that, let me kind of kick this off by introducing who's the chief of the electrophysiology service. These are the guys we think of as the electrical engineers of the heart. There's multiple different pump components. There's a whole tubing system in it. Uh, and he's gonna tell you that the single most important part of it happens to be the electrical conducting system. And as you know, the electrical engineers are generally regarded as the smartest guys basically who are around, and you'll, you'll probably see that. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Uh, Valder Abeno, who you're gonna hear from. So he originally comes, you're gonna hear from the European team. So let me tell you my background. And so one of the most common questions I get is where'd you get that crazy accent from? So, so this is, you're gonna hear from the European contingent. I'm Scottish originally. Uh, went to medical school in Edinburgh, and then I, when I immigrated, went to Emory in Atlanta, did all my training there, and then came down to the wild, wild west of Houston about 14 years ago. So, so I'm the British representative here, and now you're going to hear from the other member of the European Union, and he's coming from Spain. So uh, Dr. Valder Abeno, his first name is Miguel, graduated in 1994, and then he also moved to the United States, where he did a lot of his training at the UCLA uh, in Los Angeles, and did his cardiology and his EP electrophysiology fellowship at Cedar Sinai. Cedar Sinai is kind of regarded as one of the top, you know, five hospitals in the United States. So his pedigree, other than being a Spaniard, is pretty good. You know, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> Following training, he basically he joined the faculty at, also at UCLA at the David Geffen School. I became the director of the division of uh, cardiac electrophysiology at Houston Methodist Hospital when he moved down here, where he is to this day. Now, he is a very talented uh, interventionist in terms of treating and, and doing a procedure ablations. He's also, there are not that many people who, who have busy clinical practices and can carry on research to the point that they can get NIH funding. That's kind of the cream of the crop, and he is one of them. In fact, not only does he run a multi-center clinical trial, he designed the whole concept of what's called rain and martial infusion. I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit about that. And so he leads a multi-center clinical trial funded by the NIH, looking at a whole new concept, potentially in treating uh, atrial fibrillation. And so you're in for a treat. He's also kind of a fun guy to listen to. Let me introduce Dr. Miguel Valderabano. He got foot surgery, so he's limping a lot. So come on up. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to work in this institution and having people in make nice introductions for me. So um, you heard that the, the cardiovascular system is, is about pumps and pipes, but if it weren't uh, for electricity, it wouldn't work. And the heart is controlled by electricity. Let me see if this movie plays. In a normal heartbeat, we have a natural pacemaker here in the right upper chamber. This fires electricity like a battery. Think of it like a heart's battery. And electricity spreads like a wave first through the upper chambers, and then it arrives to this little wire called AV node that then funnels the electricity very rapidly to the lower chambers. In, and in normal heartbeats, you get a nice sequence of upper chambers first, lower chambers second. That also ensures that the upper chambers pump into the lower chambers, helping the, the filling of the lower chambers. And that's the optimal uh, function, and that's what you would see on an electrocardiogram. You see a little P wave, this little guy is the upper chambers, and then the spike is the lower chambers. 
So what happens in AFib? In AFib, the upper chamber wave of electricity gets completely messed up. Instead of having one wave every beat, you have these crazy little wavelets swirling around the upper chambers chaotically. And on average, if you were to measure the heart rate in the upper chambers, it would be 500, 600 beats per minute. Crazy, chaotic, and non-stopping. Um, as you recall, in the, in the normal beats, in between beats, the upper chambers would rest. With the atrial fibrillation, there's no rest. That causes several problems. Number one, <clears throat> the upper chambers don't contract anymore. So there's no what we call atrial kick. There's no pushing of blood from the upper chambers into the lower chambers. Therefore, the filling of the lower chambers is not optimal anymore. Second, the heart rate becomes Whatever, a function of whatever number of beats can make it through the, the, the main wire. So of these 500, 600 beats per minute in the upper chambers, every third, every tenth, every other can go to the lower chambers. So the first thing the patient feels, which is not the upper chambers, you don't feel atrial fibrillation, we don't have you know, nerve sensing uh, in the upper chambers. What you feel is your pulse becoming irregular. In general, faster than normal, but predominantly irregular is the main key feature of it. Sometimes they go slower than normal. And sometimes it goes, most of the time it goes faster than normal. So that's what patients feel. And some patients don't feel anything. Some patients just go to the doctor for whatever reason and they have their pulse checked and it's, it's noted to be irregular and then that prompts an EKG. It turns out that of that disorganized electricity of the upper chambers, um, 20 years ago, a group in France actually showed that most of the extra beats that initiate atrial fibrillation come from uh, one of these four tubes behind the left upper chamber. These are called pulmonary veins, and these are the veins that connect with the lungs. So when the lungs uh, oxygenate the blood, they dump all the nice, clean, oxygenated blood into the heart through these four veins. And it's in this area where electricity gets messed up. Now, in this schematic, you see like firing these yellow waves coming from this spot. And as they spread, they are kind of chaotic. That's not always the same. That's not always like this. Um, but what's important is that these guys, this group in France showed that the first bit of AFib usually comes from one of these veins. And therefore, if you can cauterize those veins or ablate that spot, you may prevent some episodes of AFib. And that was a big breakthrough 21 years ago. Now, let me talk about one, con one consequence of the uh, atrial fibrillation. Now, this doesn't pace, doesn't move, but this is a little pouch of the left upper chamber. Let me go back to show you where it is. So this little sac here, it's called the left atrial appendage. It is like a reservoir of blood volume. You know, you may be dehydrated, you may be overhydrated. The heart has a way to adjust to varying states of hydration by expanding this pouch or shrinking it, depending on, on your hydration status. So it's kind of a way to regulate uh, the pressure in the left upper chamber. Um, what happens in AFib is it doesn't move. In normal rhythm, it squeezes blood in and out. And when it doesn't move, blood can become stagnant and form a clot. This is a clot in a patient with atrial fibrillation. And the problem with that is <clears throat> that clot can be pumped out of there to the brain and give you a stroke. So a major consequence of atrial fibrillation is stroke. So that takes me to the next slide, uh, where you, when you look at what are the consequences long-term of atrial fibrillation. Stroke and increased mortality are the big, the big bad things that can happen to you. Um, I talked about the symptoms, about, about the palpitations, and sometimes shortness of breath. Um, but uh, what can happen is, on the long, in the long run, because of the risk of stroke mainly, um, atrial fibrillation is associated with an increased uh, risk of dying as well. Not only that, it's been associated recently um, with increased uh, risk of dementia. And we used to think dementia is Alzheimer's is one disease, and, and then there's vascular dementia where you get this uh, hypertensive damage you know, in, the, in the blood vessels of the brain that lead to uh, chronic small infarcts, but <clears throat> some patients with atrial fibrillation, even in the absence of strokes, can end up uh, with a higher chance of going into dementia. And that's obviously uh, tragic in your, in your old years when you're retiring and ready to enjoy life. It's not fun to, be, to have dementia. 
So, oh, I don't know what happened there. Let me restore that. We're back in business, I think. Okay. So, um, the issue also is also that atrial fibrillation is here to stay. As the population ages, there's going to be more and more atrial fibrillation, and it becomes very, very uh, prevalent with increasing age. Um, it's estimated that now, about now we have uh, five to seven uh, million people with atrial fibrillation, and the older you get, the more likely it is that you have atrial fibrillation. It's, it's thought that about 15% of patients older than 80 have atrial fibrillation. And let me put it another way. The lifetime incidence of atrial fibrillation is one in four. So if you pick four kids in a classroom in school, you know that over their lifetime, one every fourth will go into atrial fibrillation. So it's a very common uh, problem. We use these definitions that I'll, 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 I think it's important uh, for, for patients to understand what we talk about. But very briefly, there's paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation that comes and goes. And typically presents in young people, sometimes athletes, athletes that run marathons, and typically will have episodes of atrial fibrillation, sometimes after drinking alcohol, sometimes <clears throat> after running or exercising unusual, in a, with unusual uh, intensity. And um, by definition, it stops before seven days. Persistent atrial fibrillation is the AFib that lasts uh, more than seven days. And then there's long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, which is the one that has been going on continuously for more than a year. <clears throat> it's important to distinguish this because in most patients, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation happens in patients that have structurally normal hearts. And usually young patients, even with healthy hearts, even healthier than normal hearts. And I think of it as a software problem. Your hardware is fine, but every now and then the software gets out of whack, you go into AFib. And typically you come out of AFib by yourself. Persistent AFib usually uh, tends to occur in patients that are in their mid-60s or late-60s, and they have some you know, decades of being slightly overweight, decades of having perhaps some sleep apnea that they might not have picked up, decades perhaps of drinking a bit too much. Um, some diabetes is very common. So <clears throat> they are, in general, having, uh, you could have a perfectly healthy heart, but it has some baggage. And that heart with baggage is usually the one that develops persistent atrial fibrillation. So when we treat patients with atrial fibrillation, what are our goals? Number one, we want to make the patient feel better. That's obvious. But we also want to improve outcomes. We want to make sure that we prevent strokes. We prevent uh, what is called tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. This is what happens when the lower chambers beat too fast for a long time. Then the lower chambers become weak. That leads to what is called heart failure, and that's a big deal. That has a 20% mortality in one year. So uh, you want to make sure you prevent that. Potentially prevent dementia in the long run and perhaps reduce the mortality that is associated with atrial fibrillation. We have two broad approaches. One is called rhythm control and the other is called rate control. Rate control means slow down the lower chambers. Remember in that video I showed the crazy waves and then the lower chambers were going fast. If the patient feels that the heart rate is very fast and, and it's causing symptoms of shortness of breath, the first thing to do is we give medication that act here so that this wire becomes slower. When we do that, we don't do anything for atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is still going on upstream this, this wire, but by slowing down the AV node, we make patients feel a lot better. And that leads to significant improvement in quality of life. You still don't prevent stroke because the AFib is still going on. And, and so it, it's only part of the problem, but it may be, uh, it's, it's obviously very relevant when the patient shows up in heart failure with shortness of breath on a heart rate of 150 in AFib, you got to slow it down first. Now, people always ask me, doctor, why don't I just get a pacemaker and get, 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 it, get this over with? Because it doesn't always work. Uh, because it's the same thing. A pacemaker, pacemaker is a machine that will pace your heart, stimulate your heart to beat when it's going too slow. So when do we need a pacemaker? Well, sometimes we burn this wire because it, medications don't work at slowing the heart rate in, in the lower chambers. We may burn this, this wire with a little catheter and we, we make the patient pacemaker dependent on purpose. We put a pacemaker obviously so that they, they, they can still uh, function, but it's, a, it's the most effective mode of rate control. Keep in mind, it will not Take care of the problem. It'll just make the patient feel better, and we still need to 
uh, address the risk of stroke. So uh, you might have heard about us shocking the patient. What we do is we, we get the patient in a fib. This is, in this case, it's flutter, which is a variant of this problem. And then we shock them, and we get them back in normal rhythm. It's done. It takes five, five minutes. We shock the patient under, under sedation because it obviously hurts. Um, and we need to make sure there's no clot in sitting in the upper chambers before we do that because if there's a clot and we shock the patient, the clot may go to the brain, so we don't want to do that. Um, and again, it doesn't prevent AFib from coming back. This is something we do just to get them out of AFib. And I do that typically when the patient comes to see me for the first time. They say, listen, I went to the doctor. They found this AFib. What do I do now? Well, let's get you out of it and see whether it, comes, whether it comes back. Let's check what kind of heart you have and see what we can work to get you in normal rhythm. Then there are drugs. Drugs, we give them, and drugs can be tricky. Drugs to get you out of AFib work in about half of the time and many times give you side effects that could be very, very bad. The most common drug is called amiodarone, which is good for the heart but bad elsewhere. It can damage your thyroid in about 30% of the time, lungs 5% of the time. This is over long-term use, but it can be very bad in the lungs. The liver, the skin turns blue, it damages the muscles. So it's not a drug that is fun to, to take. Um, I don't like to use it for AFib. I use it maybe short term over a month or two. Or two. But most patients, um, I encourage them to seek other alternatives um, to amiodarone. Now, what's the alternative that we have as cardiologists? We have ablation. As I, as I showed earlier, um, most of the first beats that initiate AFib come from the pulmonary veins. So we can go inside the heart with a catheter and create these circles of scar by cauterizing the heart. We burn in the heart. Um, we create these scars, and that prevents these extra bits from the pulmonary veins from spreading into the heart and going into, making the heart go into AFib. That was the, the strategy that was proposed first by um, the French group that I showed you earlier, and that has been shown to have an efficacy over a year of 80%. Now, it doesn't cure AFib, in 20% of the cases, and sometimes it needs to be redone, so it doesn't always work the first time, <clears throat> but it's a very relatively simple procedure, one hour, maybe two hours under, general, under anesthesia, home the next day, one puncture in the groin. So this has become the most common initial invasive treatment for atrial fibrillation. Now, is ablation proven as first-line treatment? <clears throat> there are some studies that shows that it works better than drugs, but I always, you know, when I see a patient, especially patients, as I'm getting older, patients my age, I say, listen, I would not do an ablation. If you have the first episode of AFib, listen, just lose weight, exercise, make sure you drink, don't drink too much. If you have sleep apnea, take care of that. And then we'll see how much AFib you have despite doing all that, because that's going to have better results long term. When you, when you do an ablation first time, you commit yourself to, you know, the risks of the ablation and... <clears throat> Potential, uh, potential problems deriving from the ablation, and once you create a scar, there's no way back. You may have flutters. If you've had one or two episodes of AFib, you're better off taking it easy, looking at things in your lifestyle that may be contributing to your AFib, because that's gonna give you better health long-term, not just for AFib, but in general. And the ablation has some complications. Um, some of them are, but in general, this is done routinely without any problems in the overwhelming majority of, of our patients. And we do about, in this hospital, about 700 per year. Um, these are the risks that I'm not gonna dwell into, but so, suffice it to say that um, we can do it very effectively. And the lesion set has, remember I showed just the four pulmonary veins with the little uh, circles. The current, the current approach we do is we join the two circles so close to one another that they become one so that the entire back of the left upper chamber is, is disconnected from the rest of the heart. Because in some patients, the AFib doesn't just come from the vein, but it may come from areas in these adjacent areas. So we create this very wide antral isolation. Like I said, procedure time can be as short as one hour, overnight stay, one uh, grain punctured, the patient is walking in five hours. Um, there are cases that are challenging, particularly persistent AFib, patients that have been in AFib for a long, long time. They tend to have damage in the upper chambers caused by the AFib itself. And in those, we may need to be more aggressive. And this is why um, 11 years ago now, we started with this approach of 
combining ablation from the inside uh, as created with a catheter with ablation from the outside injecting alcohol in a little vein. So this is one of those things of anatomy that sometimes anatomy helps us come up with, with treatment options. So this is, uh, this is the big vein of the heart. It's called the coronary sinus. And it has a little branch called the vein of Marshall that runs on the side of the uh, left atrium and it goes upwards towards the pulmonary veins. And uh, 11 years ago, I thought, gee, maybe we could use that, uh, the, that vein to inject alcohol and create an ablation. What's nice about alcohol, I just, I mentioned earlier how bad it was to trigger it when you drink it. But when, when you give 98% alcohol in this vein, you create a chemical ablation. You give the alcohol very slowly, the alcohol goes through the tissues and then leaks into the circulation and it's diluted very slowly and it's less than drinking a beer. We measure alcohol level in these patients that get alcohol there and it's never been detectable. So this is, uh, as Dr. Lamsden mentioned, this was studied, we finished the study actually. Um, next week we'll have the last patient come to follow up, all 423 patients. It's been a seven year ordeal to get this through and I'll be able to know results in a few weeks when we do the analysis. But Suffice it to say, this is one area of research that we're doing to improve the outcome of our ablation patient. A few comments about stroke in the last three minutes. I mentioned this mechanism of, uh, of a clot forming in this pouch. What we do for stroke is either we have the patient take blood thinners, we call it systemic anticoagulation, and the most common is warfarin, but there's over the past five years, we've had the NOACs, these novel anticoagulants that are easier to take than, than warfarin. And we have strategies to close that pouch. We put a little plug in that pouch, in that pouch so that clots cannot get out of there and we protect the patient against stroke. Now, selecting what to do in each patient requires individualization. Some patients are fine with blood thinners. Some patients are even fine with warfarin, the decades old drug that is a pain to take because sometimes the blood is too thin and you bleed, sometimes the blood is not thin enough and you may have a stroke. Uh, and some patients are fine with the new drugs and some patients require more invasive approaches. <clears throat> so a few words about warfarin. Warfarin is actually a rat poison. You know, we take it in, in like 1,000, the, the amount, uh, but it is a rat poison that was very popular for many years. And then the way they, the rats die, they bleed to death internally. So someone thought, hmm, maybe we could give this to patients that have atrial fibrillation. <laughs> and, and sure enough, the blood is thinned in a non-lethal way, obviously, uh, but it's thin enough to prevent clots from forming in, this, in that little pouch. And it works. There's many studies that I don't need to dwell into showing that warfarin is better than, than placebo or than uh, aspirin preventing strokes. But we have now uh, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban. Those are new anticoagulants that do a pretty good job better than warfarin at preventing strokes and they do not make you bleed to death and they have a lot easy, they're all easier to take, they're more expensive. Now when that doesn't work, we have the appendage closure. I mentioned, I showed you the, plot, the, the pouch where clots form. Well, if we put a plug in that pouch, we can actually prevent patients uh, from having strokes. There's many of them being developed. The, the most common is the so-called watchman, this guy. I'm gonna show you a brief video of how that works. It's made by this company, we don't need to talk about that. We put a tube and the watchman is loaded inside this tube and the, the watchman is deployed in the uh, pouch of the heart. So the way it works, we get through the groin. In the way I do it, I do it with conscious sedation and an intracardiac ultrasound to guide the procedure. We get in the left, in the right upper chamber and then cross to the left upper chamber. You're gonna see the little tube showing up there. So there's a little, we find a spot to cross from the right upper chamber to the left upper chamber. Then we make it to the left upper chamber, put a little tube in there. We find the pouch, we get our sheath in there like this, and then we load the watchman. We take pictures of it with contrast. We load the watchman and then deploy it like that. And there it sits. Now the patient needs to be on blood thinners for a few weeks. In most patients, uh, there's different, different strategies that we can do to prevent any clot from forming in there. But once it's in there, any clot that may form in here cannot 
leave. And the body will grow its own cells, its own lining over this, so that over time, <coughs> blood, does it, the circulation is, is excluded, that, that little pouch is excluded, and blood just f flows through it, and you do not take, need to take blood thinners. That has been studied in two randomized, randomized controlled studies, and it shows that it's equivalent to blood thinners in preventing strokes. It prevents a lot better the hemorrhagic strokes, those are the, the clots, the strokes that make you bleed in the brain that make you die. And it has very acceptable procedural risks. So, to summarize, um, you, when patients have a sufficiently, risk, a sufficiently high risk of stroke from atrial fibrillation, we can either give the new anticoagulants or warfarin. And in some patients that have problems with blood thinners, we can put in a watchman and take care of business. So this is my final slide. I just hope that I conveyed a few key messages. Atrial fibrillation causes symptoms, increased risk of stroke, dementia, and death. Symptoms can be alleviated by drugs, but drugs do not solve the problem. Catheter ablation can achieve restoration of normal rhythm and improvements in quality of life and stroke reduction. And prevention of atrial fibrillation-related strokes can be achieved with anticoagulation or with appendage closure. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, that clarified a lot for me. Let me make sure I understand. Uh, two problems are one, the rate. Yeah. The second problem is the clots that yeah. form in that appendage. Why is the appendage there? Is it just bad design or does it ever have a function? I think, so nobody knows exactly. The hypothesis, number one, is like a, a volume reservoir. So if you're, if you drink a lot of water or eat a lot of sodium and your body retains water, the pressure inside the left upper chamber will go up. You don't necessarily want to dump all that pressure in the lungs or in the, in the left ventricle, so it, is, it stretches. So it's, it's, you can see an appendage shrink and expand uh, depending on your volume status very quickly. Also, the um, left atrium regulates blood volume through the kidney, so there's hormones, uh, atrial nitritic peptide that are produced in that appendage. So um, it's funny because one of the most uh, typical symptoms of atrial fibrillation in young people that don't feel the palpitations is, you know, I was fine and then I feel my heart racing a little bit but I didn't pay too much attention to it and then I had to pee a lot mm -hmm. because patients when they go into atrial fibrillation that, that area gets stretched and it secretes a hormone that makes the kidney make more urine. So, so that may be one of the functions. So then we, we, we can get rid of it? It doesn't make any we difference can, at that point? We can get rid of it. Some people go through a few weeks of adaptation uh, when, we do, when we get rid of it, uh, but we can. Um, it's, it's, it becomes a liability uh, in modern day. I think perhaps uh, throughout evolution when, we, when the concern for biology, or biology was to just survive when a lion is chasing us or whatever, then then the appendix played an important function. Uh, biology was not made for us living more than, whatever, 50 years old, so. so. So we hear about clots forming on the left appendage because of stroke. Is there one on the right side, and does it matter? There is one in the right side, uh, but the anatomy is so different. It has a much wider, uh, much wider neck. It's not really a pouch, it's, it's just a, it's a, Let's just say it's a, it is the shape of the appendix is not a sac. It's kind of stretched open, and it's just an area with with thick muscles. It, there's no there's no slow blood flow in the right side, okay. so and it you, doesn't you, happen. You had an interesting word up there saying chicken wing inside the heart. What 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 is that you're talking about? So <laughs> the appendage is so variable in morphology. It's like your fingerprints. There's not a single identical appendage. All of us have our own our own morphology and shape. And there's been different classifications. Uh, one of them is chicken wings. So the appendix has a little arm and then an elbow that looks like a chicken wing. Uh, some of the other types are broccoli and yeah, it's just, I think they were just hungry when they, when they made those classifications. But the bottom line is that everyone is different. So when we do a watchman, we spend some time studying the individual anatomy to decide how to best close it. All right, so why don't you come on up and change out the computer, um, and I'll introduce Dr. Wolf while we're doing this. So thank you very much indeed. That certainly clarified a lot in my mind. Thank you. Okay, so let me introduce your next speaker.
Um, Randy Wolf joined the department here. Uh, long ago was that now, Randy? Five months, four or five months ago? Um, came over from Memorial Hermann, over at Memorial City, but prior to that, he, he's been, he's an internationally recognized key opinion leader and innovator in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. He was one of the first people who was involved in the use of the surgical robot, uh, which is pretty widely utilized. Surgical robots are now primarily used for treatment of uh, prostate disease. Um, and that, maybe Randy will tell that story, how he was training people in Germany, how do you do cardiac surgery with the robot? And a urologist kind of popped in and said, hey, any chance I could try this? Because it looks like it would really help me. That's really what led to the flip from applying these uh, cardiac surgery robots uh, to being used in urology, which is now ubiquitous basically across the United States. So sometimes by serendipity, you know, we see opportunities from what we call looking at the other guy's toolkit and figuring out what other people can actually utilize. So Randy was one of the first people to use that robot and was the first at Da Vinci Proctors. He is the arrhythmia specialist here in the cardiovascular surgery department here at uh, Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Prior to that, he served as a professor of surgery at the McGovern Medical School next door with UT Health, and prior to that, the University of Cincinnati, and prior to that, Ohio State, where he had an endowed chair uh, at Ohio State. He has multiple research interests, but his primary research interest at the moment has been looking at more minimally invasive approaches uh, for treatment of atrial fibrillation. And that kind of builds on the experience in using video-assisted laparoscopic type of applications in uh, cardiac surgery. And he's a speaker who's in great demand really across the world. Not only that, we, we talk about him as having the magic hands in the surgery, magic in a different kind of way. He's a very accomplished magician and, you know, possibility that he might actually show not just a few surgical tricks, but perhaps a few magic tricks as he comes up to talk to us. Now, the magic trick I've just performed is finishing the introduction while we've got your computer ready. So, Randy, come on up and, right. and show us what's in your bag of tricks. All right. Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> By a show of hands, how many of you have atrial fibrillation? How many of you are on a blood thinner? Mm -hmm. By a show of hands. Quite a few. How many of you have uh, a pacemaker? Usually one or two. We got one, two, three, four. How many of you have had cardioversion? About five or six. How many of you have had an ablation? About five or six. And how many of you just came for the refreshments? <laughs> There's always a couple. Always a couple. Uh, well, it's, it's really a pleasure for me to be here uh, and join the Methodist team. And I think one of the goals that the hospital has is to have the very best on both the EP side and the surgery side of taking care of atrial fibrillation. And as Alan mentioned, that's what we're putting together here. I'm going to present the other side, the surgical side. And interestingly, really the first treatment of atrial fibrillation was surgery. Uh, as was mentioned, then electrophysiologists figured out sp precisely where some of the foci were for AFib and it switched more to the EP. But if you look way back into the 60s, 70s, it really started out as a, a surgical approach to try to treat uh, atrial fibrillation. How many of you can read this? It's really <laughs> interesting because it's pattern recognition. That's gibberish. There's not one correct sentence there. <laughs> but we are so good at pattern recognition that we make the pattern, like the last sentence that says, be proud, only certain people can read this. That's because you're making the pattern. Here's another example. Can you all see this? Can you see this is black and it's got a white dot on it? And if I show you the other side, you can see there are four. So there's one on this side and there are four on this side. But if I show it to you like this just for a second, you might think three. Because we're always trying to make a pattern. And if I show it to you like this, you might think six. So this can look like one and this can look like four or this can look like three and this can look like six. Because you're always trying to make a pattern. All animals do that. You see that? It's just human nature to do that. So for the next 20 minutes, I want you to use your imagination. How many spots are on the other side? And I want you to use your imagination, at least for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> How many spots are on the other side? Who said six? You're right. There's six on this side and there are three on this side. And the reason I do this little illusion is because I want everybody to be awake 
for the second talk. They're always awake for the first talk. <laughs> and I get the second talk and everybody is asleep. So I have to wake up. So how many spots are on the other side? No, I want you to use your imagination. All right, now that you're awake, the initial title of this talk was this, because I've been doing this for a while, but really I think a better title is this, because this is really what people want. When you have AFib, you want to feel better, and you want to have some hope. And how many of you have heard this from maybe your family doctor? You have AFib, you take a blood thinner, you just have to live with it the rest of your life. Anybody heard that? Yeah. And what we're trying to do here is say there are other options to truly get rid of AFib. It's hard to say cure, but uh, we have patients out 12 years who have, no longer have AFib. If you, if you have cancer and you go five years without a recurrence, that's called a cure. So by that definition, we have been able to cure patients with AFib, although generally we don't, we don't say that. I have some disclosures. I'm inventor of some of the products I'm going to show you and I still am on the uh, uh, engineering team to develop new products. And the best way to explain what we came up with is to show you this cartoon. Those are the lungs, these are the, the left atrium on the back that Dr. V described in very great detail. And if there's a focus on the, on the back of the heart, say that little yellow spot, and that knocks the heart out of rhythm, what we came up with was a device that's really a clamp and it fits around that area of the left atrium, the back of the heart. And usually about 10 seconds, it makes a line, a scar, an electrical uh, scar that then prevents the abnormal electricity from going past there. All these things work because we're making a scar. Scar doesn't have water. If you don't have water, you don't conduct electricity. That's how it works. We're very good conductors of electricity because we're mostly water. But if you make a scar, the water can't get past, I mean, the electrical activity can't get past that scar because there's no water in it. Whether it's a catheter ablation or a cryo freezing or this, that's how it really works. And now you know more than a lot of physicians do about how AFib is treated. Uh, we worked in the lab, uh, an electrical engineer and I, we came up with this device in the lab. This is a pig model. And after we used the device, we opened the heart and we saw a beautiful circle, not only on the outside of the heart, but also the inside of the heart. So the scar goes from the outside all the way through the inside. And if we look at um, this one over here in the right upper corner, this right here, that's under um, a microscope that's stained specially to show a scar and that blue part is the scar. So there's a complete, very fine scar, just like you drew a pencil through there. Using this technology, I uh, went to the uh, University of Leiden in the Netherlands. This was back in uh, around 2001. There were patients uh, that were having bypass surgery or valve surgery who had AFib, and nothing was being done about the AFib, which is a shame. So we introduced this technology initially for patients who were already having heart surgery who also had AFib, and now there was a way to treat their AFib that was easy and safe. And today, that was in 2000, and as, as of today, that device that I showed you that we developed in the lab is now used in about 95% of all heart surgeries where the patient's having, say, bypass surgery and also has AFib, and that's around the world. Uh, so we started that way and using it in open heart cases. That's the device. But I was thinking at the time, maybe I can use this device in patients who don't need open heart surgery. They just have AFib, standalone AFib. And that's what we worked on. And in 2003, uh, did the first case. You can see here it says 2003. Uh, and this is using the device in a patient who doesn't need open heart surgery, has AFib, continuous AFib, and using a minimally invasive approach, which I'll show you, we're able to isolate the pulmonary veins and also close the appendage and also test the nerves around the veins. Um, there's, uh, there are different opinions on this, uh, but some of us believe that this area right here 
is, is active, the pulmonary veins are active because that's where the nerves are. These are the autonomic nerves. These are the nerves that make your hands sweat when you look over the top of a tall building. They're the nerves that make your heart rate go fast when you're watching a scary movie. Why should your heart rate, heart rate speed up so much? You're not running. Those are autonomic nerves. They aren't nerves for your pacemaker, and they're right around that area. So one of the reasons that some of us believe that this therapy is effective is not only is it isolating the pulmonary veins, it's also interrupting these tiny nerves that happen to be yeah, right there around the pulmonary veins. The procedure that, that we came up with looks uh, like this. Um, this is from the side, from the left side. There are three incisions. This is heart surgery. Uh, this is under a general anesthetic. But none of these incisions is large enough to put a hand inside the body. It's done on the beating heart. There's no heart-lung machine. Uh, we do not give any blood thinner. <clears throat> but you can see the close-up of this is right here. And that's the clamp on the left atrium right next to the pulmonary veins. And then we also test to make sure that we have a complete lesion. We did have to develop some special devices because, as I said, we're not putting our hands inside the body. So we made some special tools. This acts like my finger going around the back of the heart, which slides in through one of the, the holes. And when we're finished, uh, this largest incision, which is shown right here, is usually about six centimeters, which is your, the, the tips of your three fingers. And that's, if you take your hand and put it under your arm, that's about where the incisions are. Does anybody mind if I show a little bit of video what it looks like? It's okay, all right. And we'll do that. This is the scope going in. And this is what we see. This is the heart out of rhythm. I think you can tell, even though you may not be a physician, that that's not a regular heartbeat. The top chamber, as Dr. V mentioned, is just fibrillating. It's just shaking. And there's the, the device, the clamp that goes around the veins. This is the right lung here. We make an incision in the heart sac. All mammals have a heart sac, whether you're a squirrel or rabbit or a human. So we have to open a little bit of that sac to get to the heart. We can make the lines with the clamp, then we can remove it. It makes a complete line. In about 10 seconds, we're measuring the impedance. And when the impedance goes to infinity, we know we've gone all the way through and made a discrete line, just like drawing a pencil. Then we check it and make with an electrical uh, device to make sure that there's no electricity going through that area. <clears throat> And we can also close the appendage. The cartoon looks like this. And uh, for what we do, it doesn't matter from the surgical side, it doesn't matter if it's a, a chicken wing or a broccoli or a, a 747 wing. It, it makes no difference because we just go across the base of it and close it. And uh, initially, the first 1,000 cases, I used a stapler. But we now we have a very nice clip that can be deployed in usually about a minute or two. And this clip completely closes the appendage. We do this while we're also looking on the inside of the heart and looking at a transesophageal echo to make sure we're right at the base of the appendage. And these are 100% occluded. The studies that have been done with follow-up have shown the success rate of this is 100%. It, if this is placed, the appendage is closed and you're done. Well, what's it look like, really? Well, it looks like this. Let's see if this will play. This is a real case, not a cartoon. And that's the device. And there's the appendage. Kind of a broad, uh, not really a broccoli or a chicken wing. I don't know what you call that one. But it's just a big appendage. And there's the clip at the base of the appendage. We've opened the heart sac just from here to here. And there's some magnification here. We're looking up at a screen just like you are here when we're performing this procedure. Once we've done the transsoftial echo and we've looked at it outside, it's completely closed, then we release the clip, and there it is, and the appendage is closed. In some patients, we just do this procedure. Some patients, uh, for whatever reason, 
uh, can't have a watchman. They can't be on blood thinners at all, not even for a couple weeks. And this is an eff effective alternative uh, with 100% uh, closure rate. Here's another patient. Uh, and this shows the clamp going around the left side, around the pulmonary veins, and making the line to block the abnormal electrical impulse, like so. And this patient also has some scar on his heart. You see that white patch right there? That's some scar on the heart. And the coronary arteries are the little white lines next to the blue lines. So again, this is a, the largest incision is about this big. We're looking through the scope. It takes about 45 minutes on each side to do this procedure. The appendage is up at the top in the middle. And now we're putting the clip on the appendage. As, we, as you saw in the last video, we position it at the base. We check the echo to make sure we're right at the base. And then we deploy the clip. And that's a titanium clip. It, is, it does not uh, prohibit anyone from going in an MRI machine. If you need an MRI a year later, it's fine. That doesn't, uh, doesn't affect that. The first uh, article that we did on the minimally invasive approach was back in uh, 07. And this is uh, early 05 was the first one. And this has been quoted in other papers over 170 times. So it's a widely read article on doing this procedure. This is a patient that was 12 years out from the mini maze. I saw him back about three years ago. He was still in rhythm. He was on no medications, no blood thinners. And his wife said, I got my husband back. Uh, we do see patients from around, uh, from different areas. Last year we saw patients from uh, 32 US states. Uh, this is one patient. He had a couple of ablations, but still had a fib and had a flutter. And when we tested him uh, for the mini maze, he was still getting some, uh, some electricity through the veins and into the heart. And that's what this is right here. This should be flat if the pulmonary veins are isolated. And they were not. But after we did the, and we looked different places on the right side, after we put the clamp on, like so, and you can see where we had the clamp, the lines there, and then we test again, and now on that second line, it's flat. There's no electricity going through there. So it can be used in patients who've had multiple ablations and for whatever reason still have, uh, still have AFib. These are some of the other therapies that were hot a few years ago. Jim Cox, who did the Cox maze, said if you're not using high-intensity focused ultrasound, you're not doing a good maze procedure. High intensity focused ultrasound, it's gone. It lasted for about two years. Then the laser came and said, you can have AFib treated with a laser, this will cure you. It's gone. But what the gold standards are still there, and that's the monopolar RF, either done with a catheter ablation or surgery, the cryotherapy, either done with catheter ablation or surgery, and the bipolar RF, which is what I just showed you, and then there are some new things coming down the pipe, which we'll have to see over the next couple of years, that also deliver energy to the heart. So you can kind of keep your eye on that, but those aren't really ready for prime time yet. The key thing is to close that appendage. And then afterwards, 90% uh, of my patients, we put a monitor in, a subcutaneous monitor. We can monitor every, heart every heartbeat for three years. This happens to be the link device, but we also use Preventus quite a bit, and Preventus is uh, headquartered here in Houston. They, study, they watch about 30,000 patients every day, and they're monitored from here in Houston. This is not a pacemaker. This is just a monitor, and it's really nice. Here's a patient six years out. He had a couple of ablations. He had been to the ER 50 times, had the mini maze, and now he can do what he did before he had AFib, which is go fishing up in the Minnesota. We have published lots of articles about this, and if, any, if anybody's interested, we're happy to share those with you. I'm certainly not going to go through any of these at this point. And we've also published articles on how to do the procedure. And I think one of the important things is we 
decrease the chance of stroke dramatically by closing the appendage. And we have good results out six years, depend, even on the different types of AFib, some of them which are pretty hard to treat, like the long-standing long persistent. Patients do have to stay in the hospital with this procedure for two or three days. Our average here is 2.5 days. And if we look at, we get a lot of emails and texts all the time. Here's a patient who had ablations and medications, and then she had the mini maze, and she says, feel amazing, my life's no longer ruled by AFib or medications. So we have a lot of good feedback from our patients. We did a short study. This was about 100 patients. Uh, six to 10 years out after the mini maze, most of the patients were in sinus rhythm. Most of them were off medications, no strokes. And if we look at quality of life, before the mini maze, their quality of life was not very good. One is bad, 10 is I feel great. After the mini maze, you can see most of them feel really good, mainly because they're in rhythm and they, they get off medications. So to finish up, there it goes, it stopped working there. These are just some more, feed, some more feedback we get from patients. I noticed that in our audience, I noticed, I recognized two people, Sam, who had a mini maze here about a year ago, right? And uh, um, uh, Mac, I see in the back there, had a mini maze about two or three years ago? Two years ago. So if you want any uh, feedback from someone who's had the procedure, um, it was awfully nice of them to show up. Uh, they can give you uh, their take on the procedure. So the conclusions, a uh, combination of the surgical approach, minimally invasive, is very durable. We've got patients out 13 years. Closing the appendage is very important. We do not anticoagulate patients after this procedure, even if they're out of rhythm. And what I've found, and I, I'm a heart surgeon, but the most grateful patients I've ever had are AFib patients. Because if you can get back in rhythm and decrease your medications, get off blood thinners, you feel a lot better. Thank you very much. I invite you both to come up here and see if you're going to take some questions. <clears throat> Turn this back on. Okay, so I've got lots of questions, but uh, this is not about me, it's about you. <clears throat> Um, so we have microphones on either side, you know, or we can, if you can't get the microphone, because it's not the easiest auditorium to get in and out of, uh, put up your hand and we'll go ahead and uh, get a microphone to you. All right, on the right.